Hello, everyone. Hello. And uh, this is almost the end of the day, almost the end of, uh, of KubeCon. So thanks to all of you to attending our talk. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, workload identity federation, in particular for a particular use case that is um, development environment on Kubernetes, and in, the, in particular in the Ford uh, use case. Hello all, welcome. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Satish Puranam. I am a technical leader and a Mac cloud manager for various cloud services. Some of the things that I'm responsible and accountable for most of the things around Kubernetes, a lot of cloud services in Azure and GCP. Uh, Mario? Yes, and my name is Mario. I, I work for Red Hat uh, as a software engineer. I work on the developer tools organization uh, in Red Hat. And I've been working on cloud development environment for the last seven years, and we'll uh, talk about that. Cool. So I just want to set the stage before we um, hopefully try to cover all of these things. Um, I want to just talk about a few things like uh, what are the challenges where we were facing along, why we did this thing, um, what is a cloud development environment, a uh, few things about Kubernetes, uh, like uh, what is a service account, service account token volume projection, and how that can be used uh, to do things like workload identity federation or federated identities. So with that, so I just do want to set some basic sci, you know, uh, context of how big we are, what we are. Uh, we started along about 2017. Currently, we do have like two ginormous bare metal, mono, monolithic bare metal clusters on-prem. We have 50 plus uh, Kubernetes clusters running anywhere from Azure on-prem to GCP to plants, spread over 2,500, 3,000 application teams, around 8,500 namespaces last time we bothered to count, that is. Some journey, right? So we've been, as I said earlier, uh, we've been in this journey since 2016. 2017, we started doing Kubernetes. And from there on, we jumped on to things like OpenShift, started with uh, CoreOS Tectonic for those uh, who are around to know about them, then started the whole journey of least privileges. Why? Because we were, as the fleet size was growing, people were running around with uh, quite a bit of elevated privileges. Uh, then we started working on how do you do, as the fleet size increases, how do you do configuration management of this fleet? And then we started talking about, as we went into public clouds, what is IAC looks like? What does CICD look like? Uh, then a whole bunch of things kicked around around cloud adoption, primarily around GCP, Azure. And then we started in 2021 what we call is like fit for purpose clusters, saying that a cluster doing one thing or one set of things, uh, rather than saying that, hey, we'll have a kitchen sink, everything thrown into one thing. Uh, few things that we talked about earlier on Monday, I guess, uh, uh, around uh, our GitOps journey, we started refactoring all our code so that everything is declarative. Nothing we do today is click ops. Everything has to be done through code. It's all declared ahead of time. And then as part of all of that journey, we, one of the things that we started encountering is like, uh, how do we create consistent development environments? As we started onboarding hundreds and thousands of people, we're saying that it works on my laptop. It doesn't work on your laptop. So how do you solve those problems, right? So as part of all of that stuff, so we will jump a little further and we'll talk with this particular slide is like, Obviously, like most of you who have used cloud development environment or cloud, most of the cloud CLIs are written in Python. Obviously, everybody has their own favorite operating systems. Could be Mac, could be Windows, could be Linux. But how do you start a Python environment? Just, just to set the stage, right? Doesn't have it to the same thing could apply to anything. The idea is that it's complex. That more than one way of doing the same thing, and there is no right way. Because right way is the way that you like the best and that works for you, but it may not work for your somebody else across the teams or maybe your partners, maybe your suppliers, maybe your vendors, they want to do it different way. So how do you solve this thing? So one of the other, some of the other challenges on the, based on the, the previous uh, uh, slide is 
you want consistent user experience no matter where you are, no matter what your operating system is, no matter how new or how old you have been in the team and accustomed to the practices and rituals and the customs within the team, but you also want it to be cheap. You also want it to be secure. The other thing that we want, we were looking at least, uh, is that we wanted to build these systems based on open standards so that when people do come in, they can extend it, we can extend it, or the other important thing is like how fast can we spin them up? For example, we could spend hours and days configuring laptops to configuring development environments, IntelliJ, Eclipse, name your thing, right? So. Then the other important aspect, as I started alluding to, is like as we start doing cloud and all these different areas that we are physically present across the globe, how do you do credentials management? Do you provide tokens? Do you provide usernames, passwords? Do you provide MFA? And all these different things comes in. But the important thing, other important aspect is like as we go down the journey of saying that everything is GitOps, everything is code, so wouldn't it be nice to say that have an environment defined right in your Git repository that describes an, a development environment for, your, for that particular repository? So these were some of the ideas that we were thinking about. How can we solve some of this? So based on that, we started working with Red Hat, Mario, and team, and a lot of the Eclipse community. And Mario, so how, can you, how do you think we can solve some of these earlier challenges? Do you have some suggestions for us? Yeah, that, that was the, the question, and that's exactly when we, we started collaborating a few months ago. And yeah, there are, there are a few options. Uh, I think that most of you probably are aware of uh, different things you probably have tried in your career. Uh, when you add to, to do some software development, you add to set up your environment. And uh, you, you, you wanted also to share your development environment with, with somebody else. or maybe you wanted to uh, switch to uh, another branch or another project with another version of Python, et cetera. So what are the available solutions for this problem? One possibility is using virtual machines. And a tool that works really well for that purpose as Vagrant, for example, was, it is still widely used, was popular a few years ago. Um, and Today, uh, we have Linux containers, of course. You can specify your development tools in a Docker file so that you, then you build the image and you will have all uh, the development environment. And then you can use um, some uh, orchestrator as Kubernetes to provision your development environment on the fly automatically for developers. Um, there, you can also, another, options, uh, another option is environment managers, so that some, something like uh, virtual end with, uh, with Python uh, or uh, SDK man for, for Java or other languages. So you're, you're able to, have, to switch rapidly your, the version of uh, the SDK that you have on your machine, so, but this, is, this doesn't provide a full isolation, but it's, it can work. On some cases, it's, it may be the, the, the good fit. And uh, the last one are configuration manager. So those are more powerful tools that allows you to set up an, uh, rapidly a machine with all the tools, all the environment variables, everything you need, credential, et cetera, for, uh, for software development. These are all the options. So we have been iterating with, uh, with those different solutions for a few years. And since uh, um, three or four years, We've been actually working on a Kubernetes operator to manage cloud development environment. So it's container-based, and uh, it's, it uses, it extends Kubernetes, so it's an operator. So it defines a custom resource definition that allow a developer to uh, define the cloud development environment in a declarative way uh, and share that with the rest of the team. This is something that we are using uh, in Red Hat for the OpenShift desk spaces uh, and also on, on other projects like Eclipse Che and the OpenShift web, ter web terminal. So the, um, the DevWorkspace operator is 
part of the, of the dev file organization that is uh, a sandbox CNCF project. So in practice, it's once you have installed the operator on the cluster, you're able to start a development environment with, uh, with a kubectl apply. So this is a, an example, and I will actually run a demo quickly. So um, my terminal here is a local terminal that is already connected with a Kubernetes cluster where the dev workspace operator is already installed. So if I uh, try to do a kubectl explain of the dev of uh, the that workspace, it provides the description. So you can see here that the CRD is installed here. And I will be able to do the kubectl apply that we just, that I was just showing here. So in this YAML, there is a, the important part here is the container image. Uh, I'm using a, a container image where I, uh, that I've built with the tooling, so there are, there are a few language SDKs that, that will allow me to, um, to compile, to test my application. Uh, and the last line, you see we're actually specifying what, what editor it will be used. In this case, it's VS Code. Um, the definition of VS Code is actually in another uh, dev workspace. So I'm referencing here um, the, uh, the VS Code definition so that VS Code will be included in my development environment. So if I run that and then I watch it, so watch the dev workspace object. Um, yeah, the, now Kubernetes, so the operator is, the controller is actually starting the container, starting VS Code inside and is providing a, um, and it will return an HTTP URL that I can uh, open where actually I will have Visual Studio Code uh, up and running here. There is no Git repository cloned. We could have a more complicated dev workspace YAML file with a list of Git repositories or with environment variables or with predefined task that will be available from a VS Code. So it's much powerful. So we are just showing the most basic example of a dev workspace here. Um, and I'm gonna switch here and I'm gonna, I'm going to open as a fully, so what, this is Visual Studio Code open source that we package in an image and we start with, uh, with the workspace. So you, are, you have access to uh, the terminal. The terminal, so you, it will open a shell inside the, the, the container, the, the container image that was specified in the dev workspace YAML file. And I will be able from here to, uh, to use my development tools. So something that uh, we'll talk later is um, about credentials. Uh, in, adding credentials here. So how do we do that? Because we haven't, I haven't specified anything. And in fact, if I try to do a G Cloud projects list, for example, G Cloud is available in my image, but I'm not able to actually connect. I'm not able to access the API because credentials are not here. So going back to the slide, and so summarizing what happened, uh, we just did a kubectl apply, so we created a dev workspace uh, object, and the operator created a pod with a development container, and it started an IDE, so in this case, VS Code. Um, it attached a persistent volume to the container so that the source code will be persisted even if I decided to stop uh, my workspace and to delete the pod, I will be able to restart it later and I won't lose my, uh, the changes on, on the source, source file. Um, I've added also some runtime containers. You can add um, some databases or some other 
um, services that will help test the, the application that you're developing. So you can add as many as many containers as you want. So it's it's um, the dev workspace allows you to to add also um, some events. So it, you will be able to run some, uh, to execute some commands before, uh, so just after the, the, the start of the, of the workspace or before it, it gets closed. So it's, it's, it's powerful. And then there is an ingress that um, allows me to access VS Code from my browser. So these are like the basic component of my development environment. Now, the problem is that I tried to use uh, G Cloud and uh, I couldn't uh, use it. So I mean, I, I could have login, but uh, if I have every time that I start a workspace, logging out, login manually, that could be uh, something that will be annoying. So um, there are a few ways we can avoid that. The classical way we've been using is you can create a secret on Kubernetes. You, you uh, annotate it, and we automatically uh, include the content of the secret in the, uh, in the workspace as, a, as an environment variable or as a file. But this is not ideal. Uh, this is not ideal, uh, and we will see so the, the, um, that um, one of the way today to um, include credentials the best, the more secure way to do that is using service account tokens, okay? So that's when actually talking with Satish, Satish suggested that, hey, why don't we try to use the new service account tokens? So for those who have been around and playing the tool, For, the, for those who have been around and using Kubernetes for some time now, uh, there has been a big change in Kubernetes 120 and 21 is around old service account tokens were long lived. They will not expire. You cannot revoke them. For example, God forbid you, it leaked and it went out, uh, you can't revoke them. Uh, there is no way to actually say, hey, this service account token is only valid for these guys and nobody else. So based on these particular limitations, the, the Kubernetes team and the community decided that there is a better way of doing it. And that's what the new one is called as a bound, bounded service account tokens. These have basic great properties. Some of those properties are they're time bound, they're short lived. Other things, they have an audience attached to it. In other words, it tells you who can use it, in what context can it be used. The best part, it is compliant with OIDC standards. Pretty much every IDP out there speaks OIDP. The most important part is the, the instrumentation that the kubelet provides to actually rotate them. So before the pod, the, the short-lived token expires, the kubelet will rotate them. If the pod is terminated, the, uh, the old service account token that was minted is no longer valid. So that was the, some of the constraints, some of the ideas that we thought that, hey, maybe it will be nice if we can use some of this stuff. So Mario, so how can we basically use the same concepts to further uh, some of the ideas of uh, federated identities, for example? Yeah, so the, the way we, what we did is that we allowed an administrator uh, to configure the way, so the, the, the kind of uh, service account token that could be added in a workspace. So basically, what the workspace operator does, it uh, add a service account token uh, volume projection with uh, the most important part here, so be, behind the, the, the path and the expiration, uh, is the audience. So the audience by default is uh, the Kubernetes API server. So it means that it's the, the token will allow you to access the Kubernetes API server. And based on the service account privilege, you will be able to do or not do some, some action in, uh, the, uh, for accessing, accessing the API. But if you change that, so if you specify another audience, you, you, will have a, you will have a token, a service account token, that then will allow you to actually 
uh, connect to other API, to other services, external services. So we, do, we did that in particular for, for, uh, for Ford, with Ford to allow developer in Ford to access uh, cloud service providers from their development environment. So the idea is that how can we take these properties of Kubernetes and the identities that are short-lived tokens that can be projected by Kubelet and federate with, in this case as an example, uh, Google federated endpoints, right? You can do the same thing with Azure, AWS, you can do it with on-prem as well using things like Spiffy and Spire. But the idea is of federated identities is that every pod is an identity. A token is establishing that identity for you within that pod, on that Kubernetes cluster, in that namespace. Wouldn't it be nice for somehow to exchange that identity for a Google identity and assume that all the IAM and uh, privileges that particular Google service account has, effectively letting you do whatever you can in Google or any cloud provider or even in on-prem without ever exchanging credentials. There's no credentials. There's nothing to worry about that you need. You don't have to think about, hey, it'll walk away or there will be a whole bunch of other issues with ongoing issues like you know, uh, social engineering, all the ransomware, malware, and all kinds of interesting ways of people are trying to attack and sabotage all our well-intentioned clusters or environments. So what the idea of Workload Identity Federation simply is to take a identity and exchange it for another identity and cloud provider. So the idea that basically allows us to do what we talked about. So what I wanted to show you quickly is like enough of talk, right? It's all boring. Show me the real thing, right? Does it really work? So let's give it a try. We'll try to see if it really works. So a simple Git repository. I have nothing but Mario was talking about some dev files. You can have the dev file. And I'm going to just launch the environment. The goal is this is going to clone the Git repository without me asking any credentials because I'm using GitHub OAuth, uh, GitHub apps and all that in interesting things. Provisions a, a volume, attaches a container, and here I am. It's fully booted. My repositories are fully linked. All my environments is set up, including all the extensions I wanted, all the settings I wanted, it's all rigged up. So no more somebody can say, hey, it works on my laptop, it doesn't work on yours. All you need to bring is just an internet connection and a browser to the table. So let's see what happens we can do with some of this stuff. So what I'm going to do is like, uh, hopefully, yeah, there we go. So here's the small token. That's my token that was minted by Kubernetes, sure. There's nothing of any major significance in there. It's just giving you hits applicable for this token, this pod, in that namespace on a given cluster. And it expires and, you know, in an hour or something like that. So now the same configuration that actually made it all happen is simply is that configuration. There's nothing special. All it is saying is that Here's a given service account on a given GCP project. Please swap, make it available as this person as long as this is provided. So that is the configuration that was injected into the thing. Now I can basically start doing simple things. I can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to write into a bucket. I'm going to write, it's just wrote into a bucket. I can read that bucket content back again. Right. And then finally, if I want, I can delete the content as well. All without using any Google credentials. Now, the point of all of this is that you got a repeatable environment, number one. All one of the things that we talked about earlier is that wouldn't it be nice if I can just drop a file in your Git repository, just like you drop your make file, Gradle file, Maven palm files, or in, you know, package of JSON if you are, but the same thing exists right there in your Git repository. And then nobody should be have to fumble and say that, hey, how do I set it up? Just start it and you should be good to go. 
So with that, so do you want to bring it home, Mario? Yeah, so um, with, with, with the demo, so we have seen that uh, how actually from nothing, so without actually having to do anything manually, uh, Satish has been able to start a workspace with uh, credential for his GCP credential. Um, so that we, 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 but at the beginning we started from challenges at Ford, challenges like that, like how can I rapidly set up an environment where the developer will be able to be productive uh, in a few seconds. We have talked about how we have decided, at least Red Hat, to invest in a Kubernetes operator to provision cloud development environments, and that was actually solving uh, problem, uh, the problem that Ford and Satish team had. Uh, and then well, our collaboration on using one of the latest features uh, of, uh, of Kubernetes, service account token projection with the workload identity federation, that allow us now to, uh, without even having to create a secret, to uh, insert tokens from GCP, AWS, Azure uh, in uh, the development the cloud development environment of the developer uh, in uh, Ford. So this is this is this was it. So we we have uh, uh, one final slide with a um, uh, few links if you are interested. So the QR code that is uh, that is here will actually link you to the to the slides, and uh, all the links will be yeah in the in the last slide of the. Here, uh, the slides are also available on, on SCAD, so you can, we have uh, uploaded the, uh, the slides there, so if, you, if you're interested to, to, uh, to download them. Um, and with that, so I think we have, uh, yeah, we have seven minutes, so if, is there any, if there is any question, we will be happy to, uh, to discuss, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. I had a question regarding how the issuer endpoint in your service account token was pointing to a Google storage endpoint. Oh, uh, okay. Are you exporting the public keys to a bucket um, for the OIDC JWKs? Pretty much. So if you, if you look at the OpenID Connect spec, OpenID Connect spec is nothing but a public key and a well-known endpoint. It needs to be reachable over HTTPS, and that's pretty much it, right? So we chose, chose to use GCS buckets as an OIDC endpoint, and then we use that endpoint to teach Kubernetes API server to use as an OIDC endpoint that we can connect with Google. So do you create a workload identity provider in GCP per Kubernetes cluster? Yes, so basically what happens in, in GCP, every, cl every cloud environment will be slightly different. In GCP, they are called as identity pools. You can create an identity pool per Kubernetes cluster, and then you can add people towards that pool, and the act of it call is service account. It's basically called as a uh, WIF binding. That's what Google calls it. So you can keep on doing it pretty much across the board, across all the cloud providers. Okay. Yeah. I think that's answered. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Um, I think you implied the answer to the first question, but when you're giving permission for, an, for a principal to assume service account, uh, it needs to be like a user identity of some kind. Are you using the individual's GCP account? Are they are you using the cluster identity there? Like who are they authing in as to perform the service account impersonation? Okay, so typically what happens is that when teams have provision, at least in Google, in Ford environments, is uh, you have a machine accounts or a service accounts that are created. You can, you can impersonate that service account, right? And uh, that is what was shown here as an example. You can also impersonate as you if you want to, right? Typically we don't do that. We just create service accounts and that service accounts have some capabilities and we let people, we control who can impersonate it. This person can impersonate it or another machine can impersonate it, right? So that's the idea here. Gotcha. And then follow-up question to that: um, In service account impersonation, you the whole point is a many-to-one relationship. Like a bunch of different entities are going through this one service account. 
how are you guys handling auditing around understanding you know who is actually doing what while impersonating that service account so what we typically recommend is uh, is basically least privileged model right the idea is that your app when you're talking to something can have some only minimal requirements what it needs however let's say we have a lowest environment whatever environment you go to pick lowest environments you can do what we call as click ops or you know things like uh, clicking around and running commands and all that stuff so this is typically meant to show you the lowest environments that is all segregated from all production workloads that where you can do certain kinds of things like this so gotcha. in production you will not be able to do that thing what i just showed you okay gotcha thank you Question, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, when you launch this workspace on behalf of the user, uh, I think you're breaking the link between the user's original identity and just creating like a impersonated identity. Does this mean that your, your workspace infrastructure can impersonate any user, or do you, is that, is, is that a problem? And do you plan to like try and link the original user's identity, so when you sign into GitHub, the OIDC, OIDC identity there with the identity, like cryptographically link, um, with the identity associated with the workspace. Maybe I can, I can actually have this one. So I think that the, the question is about like authorization, how we, how we uh, isolate one development environment and why, why we make sure that we, somebody else cannot get your, uh, use your. A little in the sense that your, your infrastructure can impersonate users, right? So your infrastructure becomes like a, a source of trust. Yeah. Um, are there any plans to like ensure that the infrastructure can't impersonate users by maybe linking to the original identity that launched the workspace? Yeah. So there are a, a couple of things that we use for, um, so at least for isolating it to make sure that uh, others cannot access your credential. Mm -hmm. The first one is that um, every developer to be able, so the dev workspace operator doesn't have any notion of um, of authorization or users. It's an operator that just reconciled that. But on top of that, we have Red Hat OpenShift Dev Spaces adds a layer for um, of authorization and authentication. So you need to authenticate, and when you authenticate, then you will be able to, to create those Dev Workspace objects only in your namespace, that is your namespace, and on top of that, the other thing that we do to, um, to avoid that somebody else could, um, so that first of all, we try to avoid to have secrets uh, because otherwise somebody that has more privilege than you will be able to have access to your namespace and to all your secrets. And second thing is that we uh, block uh, executing, so having access to kubexec in your container with a workbook that uh, don't allow you to actually get inside, uh, uh, get inside the container unless you are the user that initially created the dev workspace object. So these are like the mechanisms that we set up to uh, avoid that there are problems like privilege escalation. Somebody that have access to your Kubernetes token uh, and get more privilege than the privilege that he, that he has. Thank you. Cool. All right. I cool. think that there are no other questions. Maybe the last slide is uh, if you would like to provide feedback, this is the, uh, the, the QR code to, to get feedback. So it's, yeah, it's always welcome. So whatever feedback you, you, you would like to provide us, uh, thank you. Cool. Thank you all.